trauma that is incurred because of it? Uh, you know, I missed the res you said residential. Residential. Are you familiar with residential schools? Yeah. So oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I've got what you where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean so post traumatic stress disorder is a totally different thing. It in as we know in veterans, they go through it if they're lucky, they get over it in between six to ten years after they come back from Iraq. As the latest example, uh, my son went to Iraq and his friends are slowly getting over it now. So that's the first part of it. But any kind of trauma comes back in your 80s. So I would assume that the uh, Native Americans have exactly the same problem. Traumas at school come back to you. You start to remember when you get old and demented, you remember things from the past and they become much more vivid. So again, I think, and post-traumatic stress, we have, I didn't put it in with the stuff I'm going to talk about, but we ha are developing a telehealth approach to post-traumatic stress. The things I'm showing you here are all things that we've got in place, not at telehealth, but as day-to-day -day healthcare. So I think it would be very important. The amount of data available is very limited, so let's just recognize that piece, okay. Uh, so this is our health umbrella organization for telehealth pl platform. It's very partially funded out of the large grant I told you we just got. Uh, there's a little bit in there to help fund it. Our medical students presented at the St. Louis University medical student competition and they got second prize for it, which shocked the hell out of me because they had no idea what they were saying. But uh, I guess IT people didn't have any idea what they were saying either. So they got the second prize for IT. So that gave them a whole two and a half thousand dollars, which is a great start if you're out there for venture capital, I guess. Uh, but nevertheless, we have a ways to go. Uh, so this is what we're talking about. We're talking about, and these are all named after Thor gods to make them interesting, okay. So the Balder group, Balder was the god of friendliness. This is the loneliness things. The Munin group, uh, therapy, this is a cognitive relation therapy. Thor, I guess you can all get, this is exercise, okay. Uh, Raggy, uh, these are the depression therapists. And then we've got an Olympic group our cardinal reminiscence uh, group, and so on and so forth. And there are lots of things that can be delivered by telehealth, and we're delivering them, and they've all been shown to work in Missouri at this moment in time. So we have ability to know we can make them work, and there's no reason they won't work by telehealth. So th this is the circle of friends started out in uh, Finland. Uh, I get into trouble with the social workers all the time. This is a loneliness group. And I can't imagine anything more fun than going and getting into a loneliness group because I spend, I'm relatively shy except when I'm talking to guys like you and the ladies like you, you know. So basically, uh, I, I can't think of anything more fun than belonging to a loneliness group. Uh, I'm told that nobody would join a loneliness group except me, and so we call it the circle of friends. It's been very well utilized in Finland. You know, the Finnish get shut in a lot and they bring the people out with transport because they've got a health system that gives them free transport to get to these things. But basically, this is obviously an outreach. It's really like a dating agency for uh, older people who are lonely but don't want to date. They just want to get together with a group of people. And the differences in what we're doing to anything out there is one, we're going, we want it to be HIPAA compliant. Two, and more importantly, we want it to be ref people to be referred by a health professional because basically then you get rid of sort of the scam artists coming in. I mean, they're not that there aren't some health professionals who are scam artists, okay, but on the whole, we think that that will work better and the person controlling the groups is going to be a professional who can pick up if there are problems and we're really interested with Mark. We've been working on getting together uh, uh, an iPad system that plugs into the tele telephone with a single app, and I think Mark's going to show you some of that, that we're moving towards, which is really an exciting way to do it. So people can rent uh, the iPad or get it given to them or donate it. And we don't have a lot of trouble getting donations for some of this stuff. Uh, just at the bottom, 10% of people old worldwide have severe loneliness, and 50% have some degree of loneliness. So this is a huge 
uh, group of people that's available. Uh, the Circle of Friends provides re regular connections and discussion groups for eight to ten people referred by physicians or other health professionals. And you can see there that basically people who are lonely get more cardiovascular disease, lots more dementia. They fundamentally cost a lot of money. So in fact, this is something we want to work with CMS for, to get CMS to provide this as a early preventive intervention. Cognitive stimulation therapy, uh, which we are the uh, North America Center for Cognitive Stimulation Therapy. We just had the third international conference here, and we do all the training throughout the United States. This is an evidence-based group intervention for persons with mild to moderate dementia, and it's a very structured intervention, which again can easily be given, developed by telehealth, and this is sort of how it works. You start with the group has a name, so you can call it whatever you like, and the people make up the name. The reason for this is they've got to remember the name from each time, because when they come back, you ask each person, well, what's this group you've come to today? And so it's a, a training exercise. You have a song, same idea. People who are demented often can remember songs, so they choose their own song. They all learn to sing it every single time. And then each session goes from something that happened in the past to something that's happening right now, and you, there's no wrong answers in this, and it really works extraordinarily well, but it allows everybody to get involved, and the big part of it and the hard part is to get everybody involved. So you show this, and everybody sort of knows in their 80s that this is a horse and buggy. And if they don't know that, they all know that this is a Model T Ford, okay? And you ask them what it is, there are no wrong answers. You get some very funny answers sometimes, but that's okay. And, you know, you try and let them work it out between them what it is. And then you show them this. This is a 1936 Chevy, and you say to the group, what did this cost? So, this is a fair question. What, what did it cost in 1936? 800, you're amazingly good, as you will see. 690, not quite what you thought. You know, inflation is a real part of our life, we understand. But, you know, and you can have a discussion about what it cost, how much did your dad pay for this, you know, your mom. And then you go on and you show a modern one. So who am I going to pick up? <laughs> what do you think this one costs? I know you know nothing about cars, so this is pretty safe. It's a Chevy. It's a straight, state-of-the-art Chevy. Oh, it's a state of the art. Do you even know what it is? Like? <laughs> Twenty thousand. Anybody want to have a higher bet? Forty-seven. Okay. <laughs> this is with all the bells and whistles. It's. It's something that I wouldn't want to own because I wouldn't be able to work the bells and whistles. Okay. So then you go on from there and you say. Look at this. What do you think of this? This is a police car in Italy. It's a Lamborghini. The Lamborghini company gave the four of them to the Italian police. They're only driven, of course, by the chief of police and his colleagues. Nobody else gets to drive them. They never go at the 300 miles an hour what they do. And I thought, this is great. I want to go become an Italian policeman. I suggested to my son he move. And then a week and a half ago, LAPD bought four of them because they didn't see why the Italian police should have Lamborghinis and they shouldn't. Well, you know, but you can see how you can work with, uh, with a population to get them interested. And then you say, oh, you know what's happening now? And you show them one of this, these and you say, what do you think it is? And it's, the, you know, the Google self-driving car. There's so many of them now. We know this. And you say, well, when do you think the first self-driving car was invented? So who should I pick on? When do you think the first self-driving -car, car was in invented? Huh? Okay, you're, you're a Hersa Grantee, right? Yes, okay. So you're just a teeny bit out. Anybody want to have a guess? On this side, I've left you guys alone. You're too far away. Yeah. Go on, just give me a year. Anywhere from now back to uh, 1300. <laughs> huh? Uh, no. So this is in radio times, and it was in 1927 was the first self-driving car. So it's taken nearly 100 years to get from this to where we are today. And, you know, so again, you can have fun discussing it, 
And then, of course, you finish the session by saying, you know, here's a newspaper article. Look what was in the newspaper the other day, which is the, drive, uh, the flying car. So cognitive stimulation therapy has been shown to actually markedly improve cognition and quality of life. It is better than a drug. So goes through two sessions a week for 12 weeks, and then one a week for the rest of your life. If you keep on doing it for the rest of the life, which we've been doing in Perry County, it now turns out that a year, two years, people who were, had moderate dementia are now in the normal range. So you can actually take moderate dementia to normal range. This is really pretty good. Nobody wants to do it because it's hard work to do these sessions. And, you know, training and getting people to function well is pretty hard. So this is some of the Perry County outcomes you see here. These are the original outcomes. They're doing very well, but now they have this year-long data, and it's just mind-blowing. Now, obviously, some people fall out, some people die, so you're left with the best, but nevertheless, they're getting better. The other thing we're interested in is sports reminiscence leagues. This was started in Scotland because uh, it was decided that men didn't like reminiscence leagues because football, you know, basically was a men's thing and nobody ever talked about it when they had mainly women in the group. So they started Football Reminiscence League and then we, the person who started it, Debbie Tolson, came here to talk and then we said, well, why don't we do this with the Cardinals? And we've worked with the Cardinals and we put together Cardinals Reminiscence Leagues and the Alzheimer's Association has now taken them over. We started them with basically the, uh, 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 while we were at the VA and it worked really well. So you'll see it's just like CSD. So you all recognize Sportsman's Park if you're from here. That's about three of you recognize it. This is the old Bush uh, uh, Stadium. Uh, here's the modern Bush Stadium. Same thing, running people forward, talking about things. Uh, some of you may remember the St. Louis Browns. Um, not very many people old enough to remember that, okay. And some of you may remember Stan the Man, Stan Musel, and you start off talking about him, and then you maybe go to the 2011 World Series where Eckstein hit in a run at the bottom of the ninth, lost man up, and then hit the home run to win the World Series. Very exciting, and anybody who's into baseball and has followed it knows all of this. And then you basically say, oh, here's Albert Pujols. Can you remember him? And they say, oh, yeah, every, we, everybody can remember Pujols. He's my hero. And my lost dog was named off Albert after him. I mean, really important thing in St. Louis. Okay, maybe not anywhere else. You've got to change the sport for where you are. And then you say, oh, did you know he went to Los Angeles, and you can get a lot of emotion out of people. And emotion, connecting emotion to learning is a very important part of what we do. And then you can go from there to saying, well, now at least we've got Yadier Molina left, and you know that he hurt his hand recently. But thank heaven he's back. And then you say, and what happened last night? I put this together for last week. It was just when we were swept by the Cubs. Fortunately, last night, we won in the ninth. The young, I think, hit a home run. <laughs> So it's much better. So you can go through this and bring people up to date and let them enjoy the conversation. So this is teaching. We do this over a whole summer. So you can imagine there are lots of things you can talk about in baseball over the summer. We don't put it all together like this. The Thor groups, I told you about the Skype exercise program. So you can actually create a, a, a computer program where basically it will pick up with you lifting your arms enough. And what it does is it says to them, you need to lift your arms higher. Or if you're sitting down and kicking your leg out, it says, you've got to kick harder. Or, and, and this is all done by a sort of algorithmic program. It's recorded by the Skype. And so an OT or PT can go through it that night to see if people are doing it properly. So it's actually a really good way to do home exercise. You can also, and we've been very successful with uh, in-house in exercise program done by exercise therapists. We don't use physical therapists. We do use OTs. Physical therapists somehow don't believe that old people can exercise. I, I mean, they sort of get you out of bed. That's not an exercise. Uh, we had Mikel Esquerdo from Spain last week. He basically was the coach for Barcelona and uh, Liverpool football teams, and he's just published the data where he took exercise therapists in three times a day into the hospital. They worked 10 minutes each of the three times a day, and people suddenly went home. They suddenly basically could walk. They could do all the things that most people who are old and go into hospital couldn't do. 
so there's a, they've got a whole Vivi Frail program that's easily adaptable to telehealth. This is a Perry County exercise program, and it's just showing you from the original study that everybody got better. So if you exercise people, they get better. It's interesting. You know, they may not get magnificently get better, but they get a little bit better. Then the last part is dysphoria. Depression is very common in older people, about 25%. For many years, I used a brief telephone interviews with my patients. This was when all the new drugs were coming out. Some of you were giving them to people. You know. uh, and on the other hand, I don't like drugs. So I, I realized if I talked to people, it did well. So what I used to do is get all my dysphoric patients to phone me on Friday. They were responsible for phoning me. And then I would spend five or 10 minutes talking to them. And their scores got better. You know, they were no longer depressed. They were getting over their loneliness, if you like, because depressed people are lonely often because nobody wants to be around a depressed person. You've almost probably had a family member who's depressed. It's no fun, okay? And you may work on it, but you want to get away fast. So this is an, a thought for a telehealth program where you do this three times a week. It, what I liked about what I did is they had to phone me. I wouldn't phone them. They had to phone me on Friday afternoon. And if they hadn't phoned at the end, I'd phone them and ask, why the hell hadn't they phoned me? What's wrong with them? And they would get all upset and they phoned me after. And actually, that interaction seemed to be good for them. They, they liked to have the fight, you know. So there were a couple, I swear, they didn't call me deliberately so they could have the fight with me when, when I called them back. So, you know, these are things that we can do. I think they're all extraordinarily exciting. I think it's part of the future. I think telehealth is clearly the future for older people. In addition, obviously in the rural areas, there's almost no reason now that you can't have your doctors or advanced practice nurse visits done by telehealth. You know, uh, realistically, 98% of what I do when I see a patient does not require a stethoscope. Uh, if we really want stethoscopes, we can fix them on to the computers or have a, a, a home nurse come by or something at the time you're doing the visit. But most of the stuff requires taking a good history. Most physicians have forgotten that. And when you take a good history, working out and algorithmically saying, let's work through this, let's work through that, ideally having machine learning, looking to see whether or not the person's getting better, what's working, what isn't working for the population. And that's what we're hoping the future will be. Eventually we'll have AI, and then the AI will tell us what we should do, and you won't be listening to me. Okay, I'm finished. I must probably went too long, sorry. No, and, and we've got to recognize that everybody has a television, whereas getting internet access in this country, unlike in China, where every, all money is done on a telephone, and therefore everybody has internet access, even if you're up hundreds of miles away from a city in the mountains, there's internet access. But here it's not always there. So that's the way. When I was developing my part of my HRSA grant that had this in, I actually went to look. I couldn't find anybody who was doing this at the moment. It's obviously one way, as I say, Mark has, and I have been working a little bit on doing the iPad approach and hooking that to the televisions. But realistically, the ideal world would be to be able to put it together with, the, uh, uh, with somebody like Comcast. Uh, the people who started CST in England have just started putting out television programs on CST, and they seem to be working pretty well, but they're not two-way. You need to get to the two-way, which is why the iPad connection to the television. Obviously, every television should be a two-way communicator. We all know that. It's just we're taking forever to move into a modern world. I never understand why it takes so long to do the things that are useful. But yeah, it's a wonderful idea. It's one of the things we're going to be looking at if we can get enough money to do it. You know, I mean, it's not my full-time job by any manner of means, and uh, 